position and his power, Tara is simply an aspect of Avalokiteshvara. Tara probably stood inside a temple, and there must have been a matching sculpture of her male consort, Avalokiteshvara, nearby. But his image has not survived. Strictly speaking, Tara was not made to be worshipped, but to be a focus for meditation on the qualities that she embodies, compassion and the power to save. She would have been seen essentially by priests or monks from a privileged elite. So, in fact, relatively few would actually have been able to meditate on her image. Standing in front of her now in the gallery, we can. And knowing something of what she means to believers, we can better understand why her makers chose to represent her as they did. Her beauty and her serenity speak of her endless compassion. And her right hand, held down by her side, is not at rest, but in the position known as Varada Mudra, the gesture of granting a wish. A clear demonstration of her prime role as the generous helper of the faithful. Her gilded skin and the jewels that once adorned her make it clear that this statue of Tara can only have been commissioned by people in command of enormous wealth. It's very rare for a statue of this scale to survive. Indeed, we know of no other example of this size from medieval Sri Lanka. At this date, most large bronze statues would be cast by pouring the metal around a hollow clay core. Tara, by contrast, is bronze through and through. So whoever made her must have had a great deal of bronze, rare skill, and a lot of experience of this very challenging kind of work. Tara is not just beautiful, she is a remarkable technical achievement. And she must have been very, very expensive. We don't know who paid for Tara to be made. It could have been the ruler of any one of the several kingdoms that squabbled and fought over territory in Sri Lanka around 800 AD. Whoever it was clearly wanted her help on the path to salvation. But in Sri Lanka, as anywhere else, gifts to religious institutions were also an important part of political strategies of rulers, a means of asserting their privileged links to the divine. One of the things that I find fascinating about this sculpture is that at the time it was made, Tara was a relatively recent convert to Buddhism. She had originally been a Hindu mother goddess and was only later adopted by Buddhists. A typical but particularly beautiful example of the constant dialogue and exchange between Buddhism and Hinduism that went on for centuries and which can be seen today in statues and buildings all over Southeast Asia. Tara shows that Buddhism and Hinduism are not tightly defined codes of belief, but ways of being and acting that can, in different contexts, absorb aspects of other faiths. Tara is, in modern parlance, a strikingly inclusive image, made for a Buddhist, Sinhala-speaking court in Sri Lanka, but stylistically part of the wider world that embraced the Tamil-speaking Hindu courts of southern India. Indeed, Sri Lanka was shared, then as now, between Sinhala and Tamil, Hindu and Buddhist. And there were close links and many exchanges through diplomacy, marriage and, frequently, war. Neera Wickrama Singh, Professor in History and International Relations, spoke to us about what this long-established pattern means for the region today. I think in many ways you can speak of South Indian, Sri Lankan region with many points in common, you know, culturally and politically as well. There's been also lots of two-way flow of influences in art, religion, technology. Of course, it has not always been a peaceful relationship. There's also been invasions and wars between southern states and chieftains in Sri Lanka. It's really trade that brought people from India to Sri Lanka. You have certain communities which are fairly recent migrants from South India. So they would have come in the 9th to 13th century. In fact, they sort of merged their South Indian identity with a more Sri Lankan identity. And what is curious now is that many of these are the most ardent Sinhala nationalists. I mean, if you look at their roots, their roots are very much in in South India. And so it goes on, 
1,200 years later. The complex working out of the relationships that we see embodied in Tara, between Sinhalese and Tamil, between Sri Lanka and South India, between Buddhists and Hindus. Relationships that in Sri Lanka have tragically included the recent long and bloody civil war. But Tara may in fact have survived thanks to earlier warfare. Marks on the surface of the sculpture suggest that she was buried at some point, perhaps to avoid her being looted by invaders and then melted down. Unfortunately, nothing is known about how or when the statue was later found, nor how it came to be owned by the then governor of Ceylon, the soldier Sir Robert Brownrigg, who brought Tara to Britain. Ceylon had been taken over by the British from its Dutch rulers during the Napoleonic Wars, and in 1815 Robert Brownrigg had conquered the last remaining independent Sri Lankan kingdom on the island. Many centuries before, the island had abandoned the particular strand of Buddhism in which Tara had played such a prominent part, and her statue may well have been removed from the temple and buried for safekeeping during that religious upheaval. But if no longer revered in Sri Lanka, Tara is in many places very much a living force, especially in Nepal and Tibet. And today, millions of people all over the world still turn, as they did in Sri Lanka 1,200 years ago, to Tara to see them through. Oh.